the Kabuto, the legendary helmets of the samurai, one of the most easily identifiable symbols of any warrior culture that existed throughout world history. From its distinctive shape that often gets coupled with a grisly or demonic looking visage, the helmets worn by Japan's warrior elite would have stricken fear into the hearts of many, as its frightening design would even go on to inspire the look of such an iconic villain in that of Darth Vader. However, throughout the history of the samurai, many of the most unique helmets were crafted for the most prominent of lords in medieval Japan. And there is no better example of this than the plethora of fascinating kabuto we can see attributed to that of the many daimyo during the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's iconic age of warring states. During this turbulent era of violence and ambition, we come to see the birth of the widest range of awe-inspiring helmet designs, with some of the most interesting and bizarre ornamentation that truly went to make each helmet a work of art and oftentimes a personification of a samurai's personality and reputation, making it in many cases completely unique to the wearer himself. In this video, we are going to examine the most iconic helmets worn by some of the most significant samurai of the Sengoku period. However, this video is actually done in partnership with others, specifically with that of Anthony Cummins on his YouTube channel Samurai and Ninja History, and Scott from the channel Sengoku Studies. In Anthony's video, he dives deep into explaining the terminology and many fascinating details about the structure and design of samurai helmets themselves, while Scott goes into great length to discuss the history of the Jingasa, the common headwear of Ashigaru foot soldiers. These are both fantastic videos and fantastic channels, which you can find a link to down below. I highly recommend that you go check them out in accompaniment to this video here, so that you can truly get a great idea of the helmets and headwear present in Samurai Warfare. But before we go any further into discussing the iconic helmets of Sengoku Samurai, I need to thank this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Just like how the Kabuto protected a samurai's head, Having a VPN, or virtual private network, is a fantastic way to protect yourself when you surf the web. You see, in our modern age, it can be very easy to run into issues when you are online. From people trying to steal your information to spying on your activities, the internet can be a very risky environment. This is why a VPN is a great thing to have, because it keeps your time online safe and secure from any malicious intent. But that is not all. Additionally, having a VPN through Surfshark has other great benefits too, like being able to change the country in which you are accessing the internet from, making it so that you can access region-locked content on streaming services. Because of all these great reasons, I strongly suggest you check Surfshark out to get your very own VPN so that you can have some great peace of mind whenever you go online. And right now is a great time to get one, because if you do so through Surfshark and use the promo code SHOGUNATE, you can receive 83% off and 3 extra months free. Don't miss out on this amazing offer. You can find a link below to where you can get your very own VPN. But with that said, let's talk about some samurai helmets. When we think about the kabuto of a samurai lord, I would imagine many different images pop into your head, as there are plenty of fine examples to bring up. Indeed, one of the most everlasting aspects of the samurai is that, to this very day, we have come to identify many of them to the distinctive helmet they wore, as almost each one was completely unique. But as I stated earlier and as you already may know, the kabuto obviously went through an evolution over the years. Specifically, during the earlier years of the heightened period of conflict that was the Sengoku Jidai, a lot of the kabuto were known to be in the older fashion known as Akodanari Suji Kabuto. This kabuto design had likely been the staple throughout the previous decades of the Muromachi period, and its design as we can see is one of the most iconic, resembling what we typically associate to be a samurai helmet. This was also the style we generally believe was worn by such a famous figure like that of Mori Motonari. Yet as the face of warfare shifted across Japan, newer and better designs began to rise up to fit the practical needs of the average samurai. New advancements paved the way to more widespread usage of updated designs such as that of the smooth Zunari Kabuto, the riveted Hochibachi Kabuto, or the multi-plated with filed rivets Haribachi Kabuto. All helmets that could be fitted with a form of frontal crest or ornamentation that indicated a commander's status. 
But advancements did not stop there. Later in the period we start to see the spread of more designs such as that of the Kawari Kabuto, which incorporated more elaborate ornamentation atop its iron dome. And although these newer iterations of Kabuto had emerged, that does not mean that all samurai began to switch over. In fact, plenty of samurai kept with older styles, as many of them had been treasured heirlooms passed down through generations. Needless to say, by the peak of the Sengoku period, we see the emergence of some of the most fascinating Kabuto, utilizing a wide variety of styles and ornamentation, with some even coming to be influenced by western designs or designs from the Asian mainland. What I want to do here is highlight some of the most significant helmets that have survived over the years, to really show what some of the most prominent samurai wore at the apex of medieval Japanese warfare. This will not be a complete guide that discusses each individual type of kabuto throughout the years, but rather just a discussion on some of the most interesting helmets worn by famous samurai that we still have around today. Yet, I will also be attempting to steer clear of any over-romanticized images or false reproductions that have arisen. This is a difficult task, because so much of the iconic imagery we have of samurai helmets are hard to authenticate due to the fact that the actual helmet itself may not have survived to this day. A big example is that of Takeda Shingen's famous helmet with flowing white hair or fur. We don't really know if that is the actual helmet he wore, or if it is just the popular depiction people have come to associate him with. Because as one theory suggests, the look of this helmet originated from an Edo period kabuki play. So with that said, you will find that almost all of the helmets I talk about here today are from figures that fought throughout the Sekigahara conflict. These are famous helmets and more so suits of armor that have survived throughout the centuries and that we are still able to examine here to this day. Please keep in mind that this is not an official ranking of how iconic or awesome I think these helmets are, simply an exhibition of some of the finest real kabuto from famous lords. Now, the first kabuto I wish to address is none other than that of Kato Kiyomasa, a helmet which is characterized by its long extension that peaks quite a bit above the hachi or dome of the helmet. It is also shown to be accompanied by ornamentation in the front, perhaps a disc with an inscription or a crescent moon, while on its sides bearing Kato Kiyomasa's kamon. It is a helmet that is instantly recognizable whenever you look at Japanese art, pointing out to you right away that this is Kato Kiyomasa. However, this is also a style that can be attributed to that of Maeda Toshiie, who wore a helmet in a similar golden style. The type of this helmet seems to be in the kawari design, yet its actual shape is known as eboshi and is meant to be identical to that of an eboshi cap, a type of hat worn by Japanese nobility. So to wear a helmet like this, a samurai may have been wishing to either demonstrate their noble lineage or perhaps proudly display their superior status. In Kiyomasa's case, I might be inclined to say it was the latter, being that Kiyomasa was known to be an extremely militaristic individual with little time for pursuits he deemed unfit for that of a soldier. Indeed, Kiyomasa is remembered to have been a brutal warrior, and such a distinctive helmet helps us remember the pride he must have put into his lifestyle. Similarly, we have other interesting helmets in that of his counterparts, such figures as Fukushima Masanori and I Naomasa both figures who would aid Tokugawa Ieyasu at the Battle of Sekigahara. For Naomasa, we find a helmet that is in the style of a Zunari Kabuto, a modern design that appears to have become somewhat standard for the time, but here is unique due to its color and ornamentation. Throughout the Sengoku period, red-colored armor seems to have become this mythical symbol displaying ferocity and even demonhood. Naomasa's red armor and his unit of red-clad warriors known as the Red Devils would become a popular image of the Sengoku period. But getting back to his helmet, in addition to its color, his kabuto appears to have incorporated side ornamentation that resembled large golden horns. There is another helmet out there that is believed to have possibly belonged to Naomasa or one of his warriors due to the dating regarding when it was likely made. In this version, which is in the possession of the royal armories in the United Kingdom, the ornamentation sits in the front and takes more of a U shape. However, if we really want to look at a true depiction of horns on a helmet, we need not look further than that of Fukushima Masanori's Kabuto, which boasts some absolutely fabulous massive golden horns of its own. 
This is something I like to point out, because so often people like to think that Viking helmets had horns, when they in fact did not. However, samurai helmets did, and they were magnificent. Now, although these horns look like they may have weighed a ton, usually what was the case was that for samurai helmets that incorporated such styles, the horns themselves were made of a type of lacquered paper mache. So really, they were light enough to wear into battle with little to no issue. Both Naomasa and Masanori were known to be fierce fighters, who often took the role of being in the vanguard, the first units to hit the enemy line. In fact, the two of them would both compete for the right to lead the vanguard at the Battle of Sekigahara. It makes sense that their helmets would bear the horns of such a vicious adversary. But while some helmets had horns, others actually had antlers. Such was the case for the legendary look of Honda Tarakatsu, whose helmet incorporated beautiful black antlers. Antlers were also a distinctive look that could have been in reference to a wide range of things. They could have symbolized such aspects of a warrior's pride, status, or even in connection to something in a spiritual sense. And being that Tadakatsu was known to be a religious man, that is not too far of an assumption to make. In the case of Tadakatsu, there are a number of theories, but no matter what, they certainly made him a very recognizable figure on the battlefield. Another famous samurai who was believed to have antlers adorning his helmet was that of Sanada Yukimura. However, being that today it does not appear that we have any of Yukimura's original armor, this belief that his kabuto had antlers is just a popular idea. Tadakatsu's pitch black armor has become iconic, yet he is far from the only samurai to sport such dark coloring. The famous Date Masamune also wore black armor, while Masamune's kabuto is instantly recognizable due to the crescent that adorned it. But while helmets that incorporated symbols such as horns, antlers, and even Masamune's famous crescent were more subtle about what they represented, some samurai opted to put full inscriptions or kanji right onto the front of their kabuto. A fantastic example of this is that of Nawe Kanetsugu, whose helmet bore the kanji for love as the symbol for love could also be found in the name of the Buddhist deity Aizen Miyo, who has the ability to turn negative things like lust, desire, and attachment, and turn them into enlightenment. This finally brings me to the last helmets I wish to discuss, these being to those belonging to two of Japan's great unifiers, Toyotomi Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Ieyasu. What are believed to be the helmets worn by two of the men who led the nation out of the endless period of war that was the Sengoku Jidai? The difficult thing about discussing the armor of Japan's great unifiers is that of the three of them, if we want to add in Nobunaga as well, is that really only Ieyasu's armor is still around. It looks like we have a number of different ideas of armor for the three of them, and suits today we believe may have belonged to them, but unfortunately we have to rely on a lot of records, pictures, and popular depictions to really have an idea of what Nobunaga and Hideyoshi are believed to have worn. Specifically in the case of Hideyoshi is his iconic sunburst, a helmet that I originally thought we had no surviving version of today, yet I have been told that it is currently in the collection of items at Osaka Castle. This famous design is one that displayed himself like the rising sun. Truly a man who wanted to show that although he had come from humble origins, had risen to become the most important leader in the nation. Of course, the sunburst design is not the only one that is attributed to Hideyoshi, and we can also see that both he and Ieyasu had a similar taste for gold, as both Hideyoshi and Ieyasu are believed to have worn this type of golden pressed armor. In Ieyasu's case, we have a much more thorough example of it, with a kabuto that is in the Zunari fashion. Covering one's armor in gold was believed to be a sign of prosperity, and perhaps even economic power. Once again, another way to show off one's status and prominence on the battlefield. However, Ieyasu is also someone who is known to have worn a wide array of different armors, probably just like the other two unifiers. Another set he was believed to have worn also included a kabuto that had buffalo horns and was adorned with fur. This one was said to have been ridiculed by Hideyoshi. While another famous depiction is a kabuto that incorporated a golden wreath. A look that was fitting for a man who would come to finally bring the country into peace and establish the Tokugawa Shogunate. It is hard to discern if a real version of this golden wreath design still exists today. But still, the imagery of it remains as solid propaganda depicting the glory of the final great unifier. 
These kabuto, which I discussed here, are all fantastic examples of what samurai helmets looked like for some of the most prominent lords during the height of samurai warfare. There are plenty more out there, and more I'm looking to cover in the future, specifically in terms of more bizarre looking designs. This was but a taste of some of the many fascinating kabuto that we know for a fact existed and still have around to examine to this very day, giving us the ability to look back into the past and to try our best to imagine these stunning helmets in full usage during the apex of the Sengoku period. Once again, I highly implore you to go check out the other videos on Samurai Headwear by Anthony Cummins and Scott from Sengoku Studies, which you can find links to down below. And don't forget to also check out Surfshark. Don't miss out on this great opportunity to get yourself your very own VPN. With that said, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.